Okay, uh, we're going to talk about setting. And I want you to just think about your own setter right now. And what's the profile of that setter, of your setter right now? And then I want you to think about this. The profile of the setter, if you could have any setter in the world, what kind of setter, what would that setter look like? Don't tell me. I just want you to think about that. The stuff we're going to do right now, I think, and it's just me thinking this, but I think it's really important. But every time I come to this clinic, and it's been over 20 years, I'm beginning to think everything we do is important. Everything. But for sure, with the setter, just based on the number of times they contact the ball, you know, one-third of the time, that in itself has to be really important. We run a camp here, and during the camp, Trent Dilford, Super Bowl quarterback, will come up and sit in the stands with a computer. And Maddie, his daughter, was in our camp for many years. And Trent would come down in between sessions and talk about a book he was writing. And the book was on NFL quarterbacks, how to develop a quarterback. And he said, Jim, all the stuff you talk about, I could put in my book. Because in the NFL, there's a high correlation between these mechanics and completions. Between this footwork and this arm work. You know, they call it arm work. But they have three-step drop. They have a five-step drop. They got a seven-step drop. Everything is based on timing. It's just like setters. We talk about footwork. We talk about handwork. And then we talk about intangibles. Now, I'm wondering, in the NFL, I said, Trent, what separates Tom Brady? He was drafted in the sixth round. Nobody thought he'd be any good. And I'm thinking about Courtney Thompson. No one recruited her. How did she become the best player in the country? And next weekend, the USA is going to scrimmage, their first scrimmage of the quadrennial, and it's going to be Courtney Thompson versus Jenna Haglin, two UW setters. That's the first scrimmage. And so I'm hoping those guys do the footwork and the handwork. Think about that. So Trent's telling me about mastery of technique. Mastery of technique. And there's a correlation to completions or location. So let's go back to your setters. How do your setters contribute to your team? Are they left-handers? Do they block? You know, that's what I hear in our country. But like Marv said, Carl comes back from Poland. He's not talking like that. He's saying a setter is a setter. A setter can put up a good, hittable ball. A setter can locate the ball and get it to go where she or he wants it to go. That's a setter. I didn't say she's big. I didn't say she's a lefty. I didn't even say she's fast. I didn't say she's smart. I said she can locate the ball. We say this, and put this in your notebook, the best setters let the hitter do the work. 
And we talked a lot about timing. And the hitter's got a responsibility like a tight end in football. If you're going to break seven and out, you better be at seven and out where it screws up the rhythm. If you're going to be a quick hitter, you've got to be on your fourth step. If you're an outside hitter, you've got to be on your first step or second step or a fast second step. There's a dual responsibility. But what does the setter do? The setter puts up a good hittable ball. That's the number one most important thing, most important contribution a setter can make. So get your heads right, think about it right, get your setters to think about it right. What's the second contribution? They got to do it on not so perfect situations. They got to do it on the run. They got to set with tempo. We got to play fast. Speed kills, but it can kill you if it's out of control. So can we do that? Can we train that? And then can they set quick? Can we set the ball to the middle? When I watch the best setters at any level, there's a distribution in the middle of the court that's happening. But here's what I see with your girls. When it happens, it's perfect. And when it doesn't happen, it's not so perfect. And when I watch the best setters, they have a range. They can operate in good conditions and not so good conditions. And then they're smart in bad conditions. And they become conservative. Location, setting quick, now we can make choices. So are setters tricky? I like the word clever. I think now the intelligence. I'm going to make some choices. The best setters make the best choices. Life's about choices. We make good decisions here. We're going to play better volleyball. We make good decisions off the court. We're going to play better volleyball. Our girls know that. Life is about choices, and setting is about choices. But here's what I like. 30 feet. We want to distribute fairly even in 30 feet. And then maybe there's an emphasis. Oh, the opponent has a bad blocker. Well, we can set some more balls to her, in front of her. Or they're giving us a gap. We can set the gap a little bit more. But do you set just a hot hitter? I hear that all the time. Can you set a hot hitter? Because trends change. We've had girls early on that weren't so good that ended up being the best hitter in the match. Setters keep their hitters involved. But at crunch time, setters also make good choices. I didn't even talk about blocking, digging, serving. Of course, those things are important. You know, we want to be good volleyball players. If you have a bunch of really good volleyball players, you have a chance to win. So setters, of course, have to do that, and we're going to spend time on it. Let's watch these guys. We're going to call this spin. Let's spin some balls here. Let's just watch how they run this drill. I'm a coach, and I don't want to be doing this stuff because I'm not going to see all the stuff I need to see. And so we have the players doing it. And as long as this girl has an intent, we can ask her to pass the ball anywhere. We can ask her to make bad passes. Well, she's working on an angle to put the ball in a situation to help this girl train. Because all we're going to do right now is put these guys in situations that occur most often in the game. And we're going to rehearse it and rehearse it and rehearse it. So we spend a lot of time doing this. Let's just watch here. Where do we want the ball to go? If I'm a hitter making an approach, I'm going to come hard to this position. I'm going to hit about two feet in front of the antenna. I don't see people hitting outside the antenna. When I see it, they're making errors. I see hitters here, and this gives them a lot of range. 
and I see him off the net. I don't see him here. And so when we do this, we have competition. We have a student on a whiteboard, and these two are going to compete. Because that's what they're going to do when we play UCLA or SC. We're going to compete. And so we have to have the end in mind of where we're going to set this thing. Where do I want the ball to go? It's not based on the hitter. We're going to institutionalize this set. Just watch them right here. Too low. Not a good set. Here we go. Too tight. Good set. I can hit with range. Too tight. Bad set. I can't hit angle. Too tight. Too low. Okay, hey, wait. Let's start over. Let's think about what we're doing here. It's a great opportunity to get better. Okay. Here we go. We just do what we do. Nothing special. Here we go. There it is. Okay, that's a good set. Katie won. Let's see if Jenny can match you. Too tight. That's a hard ball to hit, Jen. Good set. Sorry. There it is. Great set. Nice set. Okay, so we have work in the end in mind. I need a coach that's going to be up here. Don't hit the ball. Just catch it. Anybody or a, one of our coaches. And let's start looking at her.